How are you all doing today? Having a good time? So how many of you are uh, at Maple Fair for the first time? All right, uh, second? Third time? Okay, so how many of you are new to the whole uh, maker movement and just getting started with building your maker skills? Okay, so let me tell you, uh, it's been um, six years now that I've been coming to Maker Fair. Six years ago, when my friend first told me, uh, do you want to go to this thing called Maker Fair? I said, sure. And then, uh, you know, I was hooked. I've been coming here ever since. And uh, I usually just uh, spend all day Saturday and all day Sunday uh, just walking around, taking it all in. And six years later, here I am, uh, you know, um, and, and six years ago, that was my first introduction to Arduino, Raspberry Pi, rapid prototyping, uh, the maker movement, and all of that. And I was hooked. So first thing I did was I went and bought a few boards, and I uh, took a membership at Tech Shop and set to work. And then six years now, um, this is my first uh, maker fair presentation. So to all you first time makers out here, soldier on and have fun. Okay, so. Um, I uh, started to do this project uh, to build a smart um, outlet uh, for this, power, uh, this company called Power Integrations uh, a little over a year ago. And um, so what is a smart outlet, right? So you take a uh, garden variety, uh, your wall outlet, and then you replace it with an internet connected device, and now you have a smart outlet. So you can control this from anywhere, turn it on and off, etc. Right. So uh, the question is now, why why a smart outlet? Uh, so first first thing that you can think of is you would like to be able to turn it on and off anywhere. So if you have a light plugged in and uh, you want to turn it off from your office, you can do that. Uh, so that that makes sense, right? So that is called actuation. Uh, the other thing is sensing. You know, uh, you have devices that are plugged into your outlet, and you want to know uh, how much power it is consuming. Um, and then, uh, you know, you might be an electricity demon and you might uh, forget to uh, turn off lights, uh, you might leave the lights on in the room, or, you know, you have your TV plugged in, your D uh, DVR plugged in, and then you might have a lot of uh, cell phone chargers that are plugged in uh, to your wall uh, doing nothing, right? So that brings, uh, uh, so that is, uh, you know, the sensing aspect, right? And so that brings us to the question of uh, standby power. So what is standby power? Standby power is the power that is consumed by a device when it is doing nothing. So you have your TV, uh, even when it is turned off, it is consuming some standby power uh, because it is waiting for you uh, to bring your favorite programming uh, on just uh, when you hit the remote button. So there is no delay, right? And then uh, a DVR is another big uh, culprit. So, um, there is a uh, as, uh, you know study that has found that uh, standby power can account for as much as 10% of a household's uh, usage. Now, when you take an individual outlet, you know it might not seem like much, but when you start adding up all the outlets in a house, you know it's uh, it has it's a bigger issue, right? And then when you take all the outlets in a neighborhood, and then all the uh, neighborhoods in a city or uh, town, and then all the uh, cities and towns in a state. Now, all of a sudden, this, this is a pretty se uh, serious problem for power companies. Now, that is one of the reasons why they offer uh, rebates for uh, energy efficient uh, devices. So, they, you know, they're able to uh, cut down on wastage, meet uh, the demands better. And, uh, you know, uh, most of you must be familiar with uh, the rolling blackouts that California has had uh, you know, from time to time. And uh, this is exactly it. It's like sometimes there, there is too much... Uh, demand and they're not able to meet it, that's when you have rolling blackouts. So yeah, so you have lots of devices and uh, and with the uh, whole internet of things, you know, the number of devices that are coming online and are getting connected just keeps growing exponentially, right? So um, that led to um, the notion of, you know, uh, dealing with uh, standby power, right? So we want to be able to um, take standby power and um, try to do something with it. So you can take the, uh, so you have the uh, remote actuation and then you have the, the sensing and figuring out how much is uh, being consumed and 
you can um, process all of this data in a smart way and be able to do some actions with it. So, um, standby power is also known as vampire current. So that's why uh, the name Buffy the Ampere is here. And I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm a recovering punster. So uh, what can you do with this uh, data, right? Uh, so let's take a look at a couple of examples. Uh, you know, you could have a, a vacation or a way mode when you are uh, leaving the house when all the non-essential devices automatically get turned off. And by non-essential, and what are essential devices? Something like a refrigerator is, you know, has to be powered on and working all the time. But, you know, your cell phone charger or your lights, they don't need to be. Uh, another uh, thing that you could do is uh, automated uh, demand response from the power company. So uh, they could request uh, you to turn off uh, your non-essential devices in an automated fashion. So if their demands are going up, you know they could send a, uh, a, a notification to participating households that will uh, start to automatically turn off their non-essential outlets and help the power company and in exchange they could uh, offer you rebates or you know offer you power at lower rates so um, what are the pieces that go into a smart output uh, first thing is you have the, the device then you have a, a mobile app that uh, you know users can use to uh, control it remotely and also get information about the energy then you have a cloud service to enable the communications between the device and the mobile app. And you have a database uh, that uh, can store all the sensor data and user data in the, in the cloud. And then you have analytics and algorithms that can figure out something smart to do with this data. And then you have uh, your uh, notifications that you can send to facilitate the, uh, the, these responses and also provide information to the user. So when you take the smart outlet device itself, uh, there are certain things that it needs. First thing is uh, internet connectivity. Now, we chose uh, Wi-Fi because uh, we felt that was the easiest way to, uh, to get to the cloud without the need for a uh, secondary gateway device, uh, such as in the case with Bluetooth or uh, Zigbee. And uh, we wanted to have secure communications, so all the data that is being sent to the internet is encrypted. So we wanted the device to be able to support TLS. Uh, we wanted to have actuation control, so we used relays to, uh, to, to do that. And then uh, we wanted to have sensing to figure out the, uh, the, uh, me no, the energy consumption, so we're using a metering chip to measure voltage, current, power consumption, etc. And then we need a power supply uh, that you know does AC to DC conversion that powers all of this stuff. And in keeping with uh, you know the notion of uh, tackling uh, standby power and uh, to just figure out the overall energy consumption in general, our policy was first do no harm. So we do not we did not want to have a add a big footprint to the overall consumption ourselves. So our goal was to have as small an energy footprint as possible. So we wanted to try to minimize the amount of energy that we were consuming. So here are some of the steps that we have taken to reduce the energy footprint. Uh, first and foremost is the power supply. Right? Uh, we are using uh, uh, Power Integration's uh, Eno switch. It's an AC to DC converter. It's uh, uh, very efficient and it's also highly reliable. It meets uh, global energy efficiency uh, regulations. And the, the coolest uh, feature is that it uh, consumes less than 10 milliwatts of no load consumption. So that's, uh, you know, you can consider this to be the heart of the entire system. Then we have the microcontroller. Uh, we wanted the microcontroller to be able to support uh, low power modes. And we wanted to be able to do optimizations to uh, reduce the power consumption. Um, so one of the big hogs of power is uh, Wi-Fi transmission. So you know, we can uh, do techniques like reducing the number of transmissions so we can batch up all the data and send it in one go. Um, we wanted uh, secure communications so it has to support TLS. And uh, so we chose um, uh, TI's uh, CC3200, which is a sing, uh, you know, um, ARM Cortex M4 um, single chip uh, Wi-Fi uh, microcontroller. 
it has support for Amazon Web Services, which offers a secure communications to the cloud. So that was uh, very attractive. Um, another thing is that we also did not want to have an expensive compiler uh, that we needed to buy. And um, so the CC3200 offers a, a GCC-based uh, compiler and an IDE for development, as well as a free uh, real-time operating system. And it also offers, um, for those that are interested in Arduino programming, uh, it offers a Arduino E's uh, 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 environment called Energia. Next up is the relays. So standard electromagnetic and solid state relays, uh, they always require a constant uh, current to hold their uh, position. Latching relays, on the other hand, just need a single pulse to turn it on and then another pulse to turn it off and you don't need to have uh, a constant current to uh, keep it uh, in its uh, current state. So we uh, use the latching relay with the dual coil for that purpose. And then uh, when it comes to measuring the uh, standby power and also the total consumption, we want to be able to measure down to a really low current, right? But we also wanted to have a, uh, a decent range in how much power it can, it can measure. Uh, so we're using the microchips uh, MCPF, uh, MCP39F521, which offers a 4,000 to 1 dynamic range and is also capable of a accuracy of 0.1% if uh, properly calibrated. It also offers a well-documented I2C interface and it offers auto-calibration routines that will help with the calibration process. So here is a look at the first prototype. Looks pretty gnarly, right? So you have the microcontroller, the power supply, the relay, and the uh, metering chip. So now we needed to, uh, to take all of this stuff and condense it down to a nice little box that will fit in your outlet. So we uh, decided to do that. We could not have a single board, so we split it up into three boards. A digital board uh, with the microcontroller, the metering chip, and all the digital circuitry. Then we have a power board, which has the uh, Inno switch based power supply, uh, relays, and all things high voltage. And then we have the user interface board, which has the outlets in the USB port that is facing the user. So this uh, allowed us to decouple the functionalities and to test individual components. And uh, for example, you know you can very easily uh, and everything is you know plug and play, and all the uh, interfaces and connectors are well defined. So you can just take out uh, this American outlet and replace it with a European one, for example. So here's a, is a picture of the uh, various boards: the digital board, uh, the power board and the user interface board. Fits into this nice box, yeah. Then comes the cloud and mobile pieces, right? But before that, I also wanted to uh, talk to you about the um, the layout with regards to uh, metering and uh, the RF component. You know, that's a separate topic of itself. So I'll just mention it in passing, but there's a lot of work that uh, went into it, and there's also a lot of work that was done in uh, writing the, uh, um, the firmware for the calibration and everything else. Then we come to the uh, cloud and the mobile pieces. Uh, we use Amazon Web Services because it offers managed services. So this gives you a lot of flexibility while maintaining uh, overall control over your entire system. And this allowed us to use a serverless model where uh, you know we did not provision a single server or a single uh, virtual machine. Every, we used all uh, Manage services from Amazon. And so this kind of serverless model is uh, uh, gaining a lot of prominence these days. And then the uh, app itself is uh, written in uh, I, uh, for iOS instead of using Swift. So I have this uh, a, a, a live uh, demo here. Uh, let's hope that the Wi Fi guards uh, are good. But uh, before that, I just wanted to have a, a, a disclaimer here that, you know, uh, since this is using uh, high voltage, uh, there's a lot, of, lot of dangers involved. So please, uh, um, you know, take help from a person that knows what he or she is doing, and do not attempt on your own otherwise. 
All right, let me go to uh, the demo. So I have this um, device here that's powered up. It's connected to the internet. And it's, it has uh, some um, lamps that, is, uh, that are connected to it. I'm going to turn on the first outlet, and then the second, and the USB. And you can also see here what the consumption is. So the voltage is not quite 120 volts, it's about 116.7 and uh, it is consuming uh, about one amp of power. And you can also see, you know, how much uh, is the power consumption for 130 volts. So uh, that's it. And I just also wanted to uh, have a, a shout out to um, uh, David Chen from uh, Power Integrations for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. And I also wanted to shout out to um, a, a, you know a, a fellow co-conspirators and people that helped me along the way. Uh, Santosh uh, from Power Integrations, who is the engineer that's working on the hardware piece. Ning, David, and Doug um, that were uh, the uh, you know helped with the, uh, getting the project going smoothly. Uh, Michael um, who helped with the initial uh, uh, schematics and layout. Adrian and Jeffrey from Microchip and uh, Ramsey from TI. Thank you very much.